By hole 14 of the final round at the prestigious Portland Open, we had a three-way tie at the top. Adam Hammes, Aaron Gossage, and Corey Ellis, all three hunting down the elusive Pro Tour win. All three young contenders that have faced more than their fair share of heartbreak. All three desperate to set right their past failures. But there can only be one champion. I mean, what more do you want in a final round? From hole 14 onward, I watched with my eyes glued to the screen as Adam, Aaron, and Corey gained and lost strokes made in missed putts all the way to 18 and an eventual playoff. It was just yet another reminder of how tense and compelling our game can be. The whole time though, I couldn't help but think in the back of my mind that this final round of the Portland Open was a template for the future of our game. A future that is more exciting than ever. Let me explain. But first, hello, my name is Mason and welcome to The Wind Read. Today, I want to dissect the Portland Open, the victories and the heartbreak of both divisions and their implications for the coming weeks, months, and decades of disc golf. Let's dive into it. I want to contextualize some of this by looking at the history of disc golf on the Glendevere property. In 2021, the Portland Open was supposed to take place at Blue Lake until COVID restrictions forced the Pro Tour to adapt and Glendevere was the spot chosen for the Portland Open. In a matter of days, Dustin Keegan put together a flawed yet imposing layout and the rest is history. Glendevere has improved year after year and has quickly become one of my favorite stops on the Pro Tour. Its distant views of the Great Cascades and its towering Douglas firs that the world's best have to navigate. I love just how green the property is and how the course forces an incredibly wide variety of shot shapes, most notably these big sweeping left to right backhand turnovers that are just gorgeous when executed correctly. And above all else, Glendevere produces exciting disc golf. In 2021, its very first year, there was drama in the final round. Kevin Jones looked poised to take the lead with four to go until a brutal rollaway in the final round snatched his chances of contention. It came down to Ricky and Paul and Eagle with Macbeth on the chase card making a massive putt on 18, forcing McMahon to birdie. An eagle matched with massive rollers and a putt of his own on 18 to seal the deal in front of a packed gallery. Last year, Simon Lazat and Garrett Gerthy went down the line and it was not decided until the green of 18. And of course, this year, we had even more of the same, but I'll get to discussing this year's final round battle in just a moment. With all of these close finishes at Glendevere in the MPO division, it's interesting how they're juxtaposed against the FPO division and the blowouts that have unfolded there. In 2021, Paige Pierce won by three strokes. In 2022, Valerie Mandahano won by an absurd nine strokes. And this year, Kristen Tatar took it down by four despite not a great final round. It was interesting in seeing how Kristen would fare in her reappearance. She returned to Europe for a while on a break, and her last finish in the US was a sixth place at the Jonesboro Open, well below her standard. But I've learned my lesson this weekend in never doubting Kristen Tatar even after a break. She won wire to wire and never once seemed in doubt despite putting well below her average from Circle 1X. It simply didn't matter. Her consistency, as always, was unmatched. The top four finishers in FPO definitely deserve mention because they all finished well ahead of the field, with a six-stroke gap between fifth and fourth place. Seemingly out of nowhere, Sayananda is your fifth-ranked FPO player in the world, and to say she's having a breakout season would be an understatement. Sai, since her win at Texas States, has been on an absolute tear of top 10 in podium finishes. She's almost overnight become a staple on lead cards with an incredibly well-rounded game. Ananda finished the Portland Open first in the field in fairway hits, throwing accurately and consistently all weekend long. And of course, Owen Scoggins deserves a massive shout out for shooting the best round of the weekend on Glendevere East by three strokes. That is ridiculous. 
These more distance focused courses don't strike me as own specialty, but she proves the disc golf world wrong again and again, and her podium finish this week was well deserved. And last but not least, the legend, Juliana Corver, another player who I wouldn't pick as a favorite on a course like this, takes home a podium finish just one week removed from winning an FP50 major. Juliana, by the way, finishing the Portland Open in the top three of every single throwing metric. She still got it. Moving back to MPO, we're witnessing the future. I've talked again and again about the increasing parity at the top of the division, but it was once again made fully evident this weekend. Just think about how the landscape of the division has changed over the last few years. In 2017, Paul McBeth and Ricky Wysocki were in the middle of dominating the division and it was not close. The statistics tell us this. That year, Paul, Rick, and Simon had the three highest podium percentages at elite series and major events over the course of the year. The same names were finishing on the podium again and again and again. This was true for decades in the sport. Average out the top three podium percentages from that year and you get the number of 82%. Average the top three podium percentages for each year, and you'll notice that this number is rapidly decreasing. More and more talent is emerging, and podium finishes are being distributed between a wider range of newer players. Like I said, this was no more evident than this weekend, with a final round composed entirely of emerging talent battling for a coveted title. No Rickies or Pauls or Calvins. Instead, you had James Proctor, who's been around disc golf for years, but made the plunge onto the Pro Tour this season and has been nothing short of electric. James is currently fourth in Pro Tour point standings. This is his second top five finish at an Elite Series event this year, and I expect we'll see many more to round out a breakout season. In contention until the very end, you had Coriolis, who seems to put himself in position to win big tournaments two or three times a year. Last year, Corey had the season of what could have been an inch out of bounds in a playoff loss to Calvin at Diglo and a missed approach at Maple Hill. We could have been talking about a two-time elite series champion, but it hasn't happened yet. Corey's skill set translates to a wide variety of courses, and I'm constantly in awe of his power from standstills or with short run-ups. His putt, too, has been as consistent as ever. Corey's been on the doorstep of titles and he knows how to get there. It's just that final step that's evaded him. And that brings me to Aaron Gossage, who's been statistically the best disc golfer in the world over the past month with two podiums and a top 10. I don't think Aaron's style of play is necessarily conducive to tightly wooded technical courses, but on more open style tracks, there is no one on the planet more well suited to take it down. Aaron has one of the nastiest power hyzers both forehand and backhand on tour. I think his overstable flex game is also incredibly underrated. His power and accuracy makes him lethal on courses like Glendevere. Gossage finished this tournament first in circle one in regulation, first in circle two in regulation, and first in strokes gained T to green. No one threw the disc better at the Portland Open than Aaron Gossage, period. His struggles, as we know, were apparent on the putting green. I think they're far more obvious for Aaron because he throws the disc so well. Despite several missed putts, including a nasty spit out in the final round, Aaron still shot the course record on the last day of the tournament. That's crazy to me. He fixes a C1 putt and this tournament is not even close. Aaron threw the disc that well. Like Corey, I think it's only a matter of time before Aaron is able to step across that threshold and into the winner's circle. And speaking of the winner's circle, you have Adam Hammes. I couldn't help but think that Adam was the favorite heading into the final because, well, he's been there before. Adam has a win on the Pro Tour, and it was a massive win at Maple Hill in 2021. That doesn't mean that Hannes has gone without struggles. In 2022, Adam vastly underperformed expectations, struggling to find his rhythm, ending the season with an average event finish of 34, not making one single podium, but what a bounce back this weekend was. 
Adam has the complete game. Tons of distance, an elite forehand and backhand, and a fantastic putt. His step putt from circle two also was lights out this weekend, and his putt on 18 to force the playoff is the stuff of this golf legend. Adam tossed last year to the side and said, enough is enough, it's time to get mine. These young contenders are hungry. Adam and Aaron and Corey and James are just the tip of the iceberg of talent that is pouring into professional disc golf. This, in my opinion, is a sign of things to come. Here's to more playoffs and to more wire-to-wire -wire disc golf in a future that appears very, very bright. Thank you so much for joining me here on The Wind Breed. I really appreciate it. Until the next one.